just to introduce you to us briefly before we really start, uh, the Royal Society is the UK's Academy of Sciences. As well as publishing, we do lots of other activities, including things like policy work, funding research and holding scientific events. You can find out about all of these other um, activities by visiting the Royal Society's website. So one of our journals, Philosophical Transactions, is actually the longest running scientific journal in the world, which, and it was founded in 1665. Um, today, we publish 10 journals which cover all areas of science and the history of science. Um, Bucci is going to tell you a bit more about each of our journals later on in the presentation. So the first part of this is about things to consider when selecting a journal to submit your research to. There are many different reasons why it's important to think carefully about which journal to submit to, and it will depend in part on what you're trying to achieve as an author. For example, sometimes you will want to reach a core specialist audience, whereas sometimes you might want to reach a new or an interdisciplinary audience. Picking the right journal can help you with this. In other situations, you might actually be being pushed to make certain decisions depending on the requirements from others, such as your university or your funder. In all cases, targeting the right journal can help to make the process as smooth as possible and increase your chance of success. It's very important to think critically and realistically about your work right at the start when you're choosing which journal to submit to. However good your research paper is, journals have their own criteria about they, what they publish and understanding this and assessing whether your paper fits their criteria is really essential. For example, some journals only publish the most absolutely most important breakthroughs and very novel content. Others are aimed at a very broad audience and are therefore looking for papers that have wide applications, whereas others are specialists for a particular field. So working out realistically where your paper sits within this field of different journals is really important. And it's always good to aim high, of course, but you're just wasting your time and those of the journals, editors and reviewers by, by aiming too high or, or going for an unrealistic journal. So once you've assessed your own paper, you need to have a careful look at potential journals to see which one will actually suit your requirements the best. One of the best ways to find the right journal is to look at where others have published similar work. Look at the literature in your subject area to see where papers are published and also look at their reference lists to see which journals they are citing. As mentioned before, it's essential to be realistic when choosing comparison articles. Even if they're on a similar topic or subject area to yours, they might actually be a very different type of article. Browsing the table of contents lists for a particular journal will give you a really good sense of what that journal is looking for. It is also always worth asking your colleagues for their recommendations about what journals they've published in. If you can see that um, some authors always publish or publish very regularly in a particular journal, then that could also be a good indication as it might mean that they're happy with the service that they get there. Uh, repeat custom is a really good indicator of, of a good journal experience. So of course, it's also important to make sure that the right people are going to find your, your article. So ensure that the journal that you pick is actually indexed in the key search databases that you use to find material yourself. So for example, uh, Web of Science or PubMed. If your work is likely to be of interest to a non-academic audience, such as practitioners, for example, you might need to look at open access or free, uh, free access options. If your uh, material is likely to be of particular public interest, then you might want to look for a publisher that will actually help you to promote your paper. So for example, through press releases or, or marketing of individual papers. So you've probably all heard about different types of journal metrics. Uh, metrics can give you some insight into a journal's performance, but we always urge you to please be very careful when using these. For example, the impact factor is the most well-known metric and is often used to make assessments on research output. 
However, the impact factor is an average, and it's therefore highly affected by one or two very highly cited papers, and doesn't really give you a good, good idea of how your own paper might perform. Looking at the performance of an individual paper that is similar to yours could be a lot more useful. So for example, looking at um, and ways to do this, there's various ways to do this. So for example, you can look at the altmetric score. So that's this colorful ring on the bottom right of this slide. Um, this is uh, a score that's given to individual papers that shows you how much the paper has actually been mentioned in places like social media or blogs and things like that, which in some fields that can actually be a more, a better indication of impact than actual citations. Um, the number of downloads the uh, paper receives can also give you a really good sense of how many people are reading an individual article. So the Royal Society and our journals are sig signatories of something called DORA, which is the Declaration on Research Assessment. This is an initiative which works to improve the ways in which the outputs of scholarly research are evaluated, where the quality of paper is actually more important than the journal title or the publisher. One of the ways um, that we uh, are involved with this is by actually publishing a range of different metrics and including these article level metrics um, and not just relying on the impact factor. So we know that speed is very important to authors and it's certainly something to consider when picking a journal. Many publishers show their average times on their website and you can also look at this yourself from dates given on an individual paper. So for example, the submission date and the publication date. However, please do always bear in mind that these are averages and times cannot be guaranteed by the journal. As you'll see in the next section of this, this presentation, there are many stages to go through where your paper could potentially be delayed. You need to make sure that you will also be happy with the service that the journal will offer you and how your final published paper will look. So you should read some papers in the journal to see whether they have been edited well and are easy to read and navigate. It is particularly important to make sure that your journal, chosen journal can cater for any special requirements that you might have. So for example, if you've got a lot of video content or particularly large files or supplements, then just make sure before you submit that the journal will be able to handle those. So something that may or may not be important to you is who will benefit from your research. All journal publishers make money from author fees or library subscriptions. For societies and other not-for-profit organizations, this can be one of their main revenue streams and actually allows them to carry out a lot of their services to the scientific community, both by covering running costs for their organization, but also as funds for meetings or prizes, for example. The Royal Society publishes our journals ourselves, but many other societies actually partner with commercial publishers, and in those circumstances, both parties will benefit from, from that. So just before we end this first section, a word of warning. Um, just please make sure that you check that your chosen journal is reputable. Once your paper's published, it's actually very difficult to get that back or to publish that work elsewhere. There are lots of journals out there and some have very similar names. So please do check carefully before clicking on the submit button. There are resources out there to help you, such as the directory of open access journals. Um, there's something called the Think Check Submit website that we've given a link to there. Uh, this also provides very useful checklists in many languages to help you to make the right choice. And we'll give you a few more links to other places at the end of this webinar. Thank you, Helen, and hello, everyone. So in this section, we will be taking a look behind the scenes of the publishing process to help you better understand how it all works and hopefully give you the best chance of getting your work successfully published. So what actually happens to your paper? So for some, the peer review process can seem like a magical black box where your paper disappears into, you don't really know what's happened to it and when it happened, and then at the end, you're presented with several different outcomes. 
What you can see from this journal stream um, is a typical process that involves multiple people at multiple stages and often means multiple processes. So in this example, once the author submits, the editorial office checks the suitability and completeness of the paper. This is then sent to a handling or associate editor who checks if the research presented is sound and they're the ones that are responsible for deciding whether the manuscript goes to peer review or not. Um, the editors may choose two, three, or possibly more reviewers to cover different topics covered in the paper. And the reviewers are carefully selected to ensure that they have the right expertise and do not have any conflicts of interests. The reports are then evaluated by the handling editor who makes a recommendation. And it is then that the editor who is responsible makes the final decision. So as you can see with the number of people and stages in the process that it does cost everyone in terms of time. And so it, it really is worth paying attention and, dress, and addressing the feedback given throughout the process where possible. And that is key to success. One thing to note is that rejection can happen at many different stages at the, uh, of the process. And these are for different reasons. So it is always good to pay attention to the feedback and ask the editors for clarity where you're not sure. Of course, journals have different stages and models and we'll look at those in a moment. So the board is usually made up of um, carefully selected experts covering the journal scope and they tend to be either professional editors that work in house or external practicing scientists or a mixture of both. It is well worth looking at the boards to see if you recognize the editors and perhaps they are researchers whose work you admire and you do recognize the boards and the, the people and their publications. So these are all good indications of suitability. So the job of the editor is multi multifaceted. A journal is only good as its team and it relies on the expertise of editors for their assessment to oversee the peer review process and to reject papers that are out of scope. And this in turn helps to limit the workload of the reviewers. Editors also have the job to look for evidence of misconduct and deal with any eth ethical issues. They're also on hand to help answer queries from authors or reviewers relating to the scientific content. Firstly, editors check that the paper itself is in scope. As Helen outlined earlier, authors can fall at this first hurdle by not selecting the right venue for their work. Editors essentially ask for three things when they assess the paper. Is it new? Is it true? And does it add value? What they really want to know are the reasons why you want to publish and why you think it is important and why you want to share your work. And in reality, given that we just described that many of these editor, editors are practicing scientists, they themselves are limited in time and some editors will judge a paper on the abstract and title alone. And this is where writing a good abstract really comes into play. The value of an abstract shouldn't be ignored and it is a powerful tool to summarize why the work was done and what the problem being, is being addressed and what you actually did, what you found out and what your conclusion is. Most journals will say on their website what their review process is, so we would recommend that you check the information given for reviewers and authors. The, the three most common types of peer review are single blind, double blind and open peer review. Over time, new models have developed such as transparent or collaborative and post peer review and these are all variations from quite a standard approach. Peer review itself is constantly evolving with new models taking over traditional ways. So it is worth looking at these closely to make sure that you are happy with the process for the journal you choose. So to go through what these processes mean, single blind means that the authors don't know the identity of the reviewer. Double blind means that the reviewer doesn't know the identity of the author and vice versa. Open peer review, the identity of the author and the reviewer is known by all participants, perhaps during or after the review process, 
However, the level of information made available can vary depending on the journal. Other types of peer review does include transparent peer review, which we will discuss in a moment. Collaborative, this is a type where two or more reviewers can work together and submit one unified report or the author revises the manuscript under the supervision of one or more reviewers. And post-publication review is also something that is emerging. And this means that reviews are solicited or unsolicited of the published paper and peer review occurs afterwards. So some of the journals, as mentioned, um, do operate open peer review. And this means that the review process is made as transparent as possible. In most cases, this means that the reviewer reports, the decision letter, any associated author responses are made public to readers alongside the published articles. Some publishers um, do allow reviewers to choose whether or not they wish to share their identity, but they do also encourage them to share their reports, as is done on some of our journals, including Open Biology, Royal Society Open Science, Proceedings A and Proceedings B. So you may be familiar with the term transfer or cascade journal. This is where your work has been judged to be unsuitable for that particular journal, but some publishers may offer other options to transfer your work to another one of their journals. So for an example, um, our journal Royal Society Open Science offers this option and um, it accepts manuscripts from our other journals. The, be the benefits to this include saving time to you as authors, since you won't need to start a new submission elsewhere, and it helps you find a home for your research. Articles that are transferred are then evaluated through the journal's usual processes, and that helps to ensure the, article, the article's quality, um, that, to make sure it's valid and is also relevant. It should be noted that the um, offer of a transfer is not a guarantee of acceptance. So here you'll see a list of resources which, we, which you may find useful. And uh, please feel free to take a snapshot of this and we'll pause at a moment to give you a chance to do that. So I'm going to walk you through um, some of the things you might need to understand when selecting journal how to submit a paper for publication and this part of the, the presentation will probably take about 15 minutes. So I think the first thing to say is that there are a very wide range of policies that journals and publishers have adopted um, to support their publishing endeavours and to provide guidance and support for authors. Um, it's important that you understand your obligations as authors before you submit to a journal and also so you understand what journals are, or well, the responsibilities journals have towards you as well. Um, many funds and institutions now require that research will be, uh, that they fund that, or conducted at for that matter, um, will be made open access, for instance. So you need to be aware of what your uh, funder or your publisher, I beg your pardon, your funder or your employer expect of you when you're submitting your research. Um, but and associated with that is you need to be aware of what conditions publishers have for publication. Um, again, Leanne and Sarah talk about this in greater depth shortly, but do you uh, need to make your data accessible or format your paper in a particular style when submitting? Um, all this information should be available at the journal or publisher's website. Um, again, as I mentioned a moment ago, do you need to make your, uh, or do you want to make your work available under an open access license? If so, what kind of open access? Um, is available at the, the journal or the publisher. Um, I'll talk about two example kind of models of open access shortly. Um, copywriting, you spend a lot of time and effort producing your work. You need to make sure you understand who retains access to your uh, copyright if you've submitted it uh, and have the paper accepted and published. Um, many publishers, um, including the Royal Society, now ensure that authors retain copyright of the work, but not all do. So again, make sure you understand uh, what you're being asked to sign if you're asked to sign any copyright or license to publishers agreements. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that uh, 
Whilst many publishers permit the use of preprint servers for deposition of work before it is submitted to a journal for publication, um, not every publisher does permit the use of preprints before you submit uh, from a before you submit your research to the publisher for consideration for publication. Be aware and ensure uh, that you understand what you can do before you submit your work and indeed after you submit your work to a repository or indeed a journal. Uh, many publishers, uh, including the Royal Society, will have made their, uh, their journal policies available online, either on so-called umbrella pages like ours here, or indeed at the individual journal homepage level. Um, generally, this information will be uh, very clear and you'll be able to find the answers to all common questions on the journal websites. Um, but if you can't find the answer to the question, do get in touch with the journal or the publisher uh, and contact details should be available um, on those websites. If you can't find contact details or you can't find information about journal policies, ask yourself whether the journal is considered trustworthy, whether you would be happy to submit your work to that journal. It can be very hard to get papers back after they've been submitted to publishers with perhaps questionable practices, um, and particularly after papers have been published out of them. So be very careful you understand who and what you're submitting to. So a number of um, common requirements, some which I've alluded to already, um, are identified here, and I'll expand on those in more detail um, as we go through the presentation. Um, but it's, I think probably the key thing to take from this slide is it's important to be aware that you're going to be asked, probably, to sign a declaration saying you comply with the journal policies. This will generally be a, a question on submission form or perhaps a separate document you have to supply. Um, but it's important that you are aware of the responsibility of the author to ensure that you know what you're signing up to. Um, but again, general administrative offices are there to help you. If you'll never, if you ever find a question you're not sure the answer to, get in touch with the journal. They'll be able to help you. And it's far better to ask those questions before you submit a paper than it is generally during the, the submission process, as it can save a lot of time and potential disappointment down the line if your first choice journal can't supply the, the policies that you uh, are required to sign up to or want to sign up to. So um, it's important to be aware of. Uh, ethical publishing um, and ethical standards and legal standards and legal requirements that you may be uh, required to adhere to um, that is associated with your research. Um, generally, this will mean before you even start doing your research, you need to engage with your uh, institutional uh, ethical review board or review boards if you're planning on conducting work that might, uh, or you have any kind of ethical questions about the work. Uh, that's to ensure that the appropriate standards and, and permits are or standards are met and permits granted if necessary. That's particularly important and I'll talk about in a slide in a moment if you're dealing with human or animal subjects. But it's very important as well that you shouldn't fabricate or falsify data nor conduct prohibited research. It perhaps goes out saying, um, but uh, if you conduct practice like that, papers may be rejected, uh, investigations into kind of research practices might be conducted by your institution, and there might even be disciplinary action taken against uh, yourself, your colleagues, etc. So it's important to get your uh, understanding of what uh, constitutes ethical practice and good practice before you conduct the research and certainly before you submit it to a journal. Um, but again, institutional review bodies can help with that. Uh, your senior colleagues can help provide guidance there, or indeed publishers can provide some guidance there. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that in the event that you go through all the ethical kind of hoops you have to jump through and you should be jumping through to ensure your work is, is ready to go, um, if the work doesn't produce the output you were expecting, that's not necessarily a problem. I need many outlook, um, out, many journals, including Royal Society of Open Science, that I have responsibility for at the Royal Society, do consider negative results um, and will consider publication negative results. So if it all appears lost, get in touch with the journal, they may be able to help you anyway. So I've alluded to this a moment ago, um, but one of the things that it's important to be aware of is Ensuring if you're working with animal subjects or human test subjects that you have gone through the appropriate ethical approvals, got the permits you need. Uh, and if you're dealing with humans, making sure that um, those individuals you're working with are able to give informed consent of that they are involved with the study. Um, if you're working with children or other vulnerable groups, you need to make sure you understand what consent's been given by whom. Um, for example, parents or guardians or carers of those individuals and make sure you have that informed consent. Um, it's also important to bear in mind that not only are you publishing for your own benefit, you're benefit, publishing for the benefit of the wider scientific community. Um, and one way of ensuring that your work can be verified and that others can build on your work and support uh, endeavors 
is to ensure that you provide the fullest account of your methodology and your materials, as well as any legal ethical requirements you've been required to fulfill um, in your manuscript so that a reader can potentially conduct a uh, replication. And uh, replications, particularly if they are pre-registered, can be a very powerful tool in, in verifying research. Um, but it's also important throughout this process, you are aware of any potential conflicts of interest that uh, need to be declared to an editorial office and to a journal. Uh, these might be financial disclosures. Um, if, for instance, you stand to make a large sum of money from the successful conclusion of your research and its publication, that the journalist probably won't want to know about. Um, equally, if, you're, uh, if you have very close personal professional relationships with many people working in your field, or indeed you have a professional disagreements with people working in your field, it's often important to make this clear at the start of the uh, process. Generally, Competing interests of this nature will be fine, but it's important to check with the journal before you submit and they can provide further guidance. So, uh, again, something to get sorted out before you submit to a journal is who should be listed as an author uh, versus individuals who should be listed in the acknowledgements of a journal, of, of a paper rather. Um, our working definition of who constitutes an author is based on the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors' Guidance. Um, and these four, four bullet points here identify those kind of four key constituents um, that go into determining whether an individual is an author or should be listed in the acknowledgements. Um, and it's again very important you set these things out clearly before you submit to a publisher because journals can't generally get involved in authorship disputes. So we really do urge research groups to be very clear before they submit and make sure you've gone through the process of talking to your colleagues and establishing who will be listed as what author. And sort of avoid things like ghost authorships or um, other citation metric scheme behavior or indeed disputes amongst you and your colleagues at later dates. So some tips to bear in mind uh, in terms of authorship. Um, assuming an individual is suitable to be included in the author list rather than the acknowledgements, um, you need to make sure that you've decided who's going to be, for example, the first author or generally the person who's contributed most of the work. Um, and who is going to be listed as the last author. And again, generally, this will be the team leader or the most senior author in the group, uh, assuming you have multiple authors on the, uh, the paper, of course. Um, you need to be clear who did what in the manuscript. Uh, increasingly, journals are asking authors to declare their contributions to the research. And this might be included in the manuscript itself or a specific question in a journal submission form. Um, there is a, a movement to use what's a credit taxonomy, uh, which is standard formats uh, for this information, more and more journals begin to use that. So again, if you can use that, that might help you. Um, it's also important that at least one individual is listed as a corresponding author, also the corresponding author. And they will be responsible for correspondence both before, well, not before, but during the peer review process and after acceptance if a paper is accepted. Um, and again, it's important to bear in mind that whilst it is often the case that the same individual who submits the work will be by default the corresponding author, it should be borne in mind this isn't always the case and the two roles can potentially be divided amongst two authors. Whether that's recommended is really up to you uh, to decide amongst yourselves. So, dual redundant publication. Um, publishers understand that authors are keen for their work to be published quickly. Um, and there is a temptation perhaps to submit work to multiple venues to, to speed up that process. Uh, but it's important that that doesn't happen, that you do not submit your work, your manuscript to multiple journals simultaneously. Um, this is for a number of reasons. Um, partly it's to uh, avoid overburdening editors and reviewers and, and slowing down the process for everybody, not just yourself, but other colleagues working in the field and broader field as well. Um, it's also important that if you do submit your paper to multiple venues and the paper appears twice or more in index, indexing and abstracting services, um, this will have implications for meta-analysis and citation counts uh, and can also be seen as a form of self-plagiarism, so which is strongly discouraged. So it's very important you don't uh, submit the same paper multiple times at the same time. Uh, in sequence is okay, in parallel is not. Um, if you are, as I'm sure you will be, working on uh, areas that are uh, have been uh, developed by colleagues previously and you're going to be building on others' work, um, rephrasing uh, methodologies or discussion and so on, and citing an original source in your paper from a, a third party is generally fine if credit is given where credit is due, if you're fully citing, fully referencing other people's work. Um, but it's not acceptable to wholesale copy and paste without due credit. Um, and indeed, even with copying and pasting uh, with credit. Um, and many publishers, including Royal Society, use software such as Authenticate 
to check submissions against a database, a previously published work to ensure that work is not plagiarized. Um, and per the preceding slide, plagiarism is generally considered to be a bad thing. Um, and some of the key reasons are outlined here, some of which I've mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so to reiterate, if you do need or want to borrow from existing sources, the, textual over, the degree of textual overlap should be kept to a minimum uh, and full citations should be given in your reference list. So the origin of the, the ideas you're borrowing from can be identified and credit given where it is due. Um, something we are aware is perhaps problematic for some authors and perhaps increases the temptation to, to copy from existing sources is the English the language that we publish in and many other publishers uh, work in is not a logical language. It's not an easy language to work in. We, we understand that, we do sympathize. Um, and rephrasing content from existing sources can be a formidable task, um, but there are sources available um, that can help authors write in their second or third languages. Um, and if you're not confident in the language of the journal you're planning on submitting to, ask the journal before you submit whether they have any advice on suitable language editing services. There may be something that they can point you to that will help you with that. Um, so earlier in the presentation, I referred to copywriting and who uh, retains copyright. Um, it was once the case that publishers would ask authors to transfer your copyright to the publisher, um, which substantially limited what authors could do with their work, uh, both during the consideration of the work and indeed after publication. Um, this transfer of copyright is less common than it used to be. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, authors may be asked to sign a license to publish instead. It's what we do at the Royal Society and that license will determine what you're able to do with your work after it's been accepted. Um, as with thing else I've, I've mentioned so far, if you're not sure about any aspect of a license you're being asked to sign or an agreement you'll be asked to sign with the publisher, get in touch with that journal, ask the question. Um, and it's important that any license you do sign complies with your institutional funder mandates um, and indeed anything, any other requirements you have. Um, a license you sign will determine what you can and can't do with the paper. So make sure you have an understanding of what you're being asked to sign before you sign it. Um, open access. So as we mentioned previously, it's very common now for funders and institutions uh, to require authors to publish their work under an open access license. Um, there are a couple of models that I'm going to mention in the next slide, uh, but it's perhaps important to draw a couple of key messages from this slide, is that whilst many journals offer open access uh, options, and there are many open access journals, you need to make sure, again, that if you are required to publish an open access format, the journal you're planning on submitting to offers those open, action, open access options. Um, and checking whether the journal you're submitting to uh, is a trustworthy open access publisher. There are some who have some more questionable reputation and services such as the Directory of Open Access Journals can help ensure you're submitting to an appropriate journal. Um, will you be able to pay a fee for an open access publication, which is often called an article processing charge or article processing cost. Um, if so, what's that charge going to be? Who's going to pay for that, that charge? Um, is it you, is it your library, your university? Does it come from the funder itself? Um, are waivers available if you can't pay? Are you from a university that doesn't have the resources to, to fund an open access? Uh, many publishers will have very generous uh, waiver schemes available to support um, open access publishing from individuals uh, who perhaps are less resource um, or less resourced than others. The Royal Society has a very generous waiver program in that, that regard. Um, and finally on this slide, it's important to be aware that um, open access doesn't always necessarily just mean free to read. The license that you'll be signing and to publish under open access may include how others can use your work, perhaps under a Creative Commons license, uh, such as a CCBY uh, license. Uh, but again, be aware of what the license you're being asked to do, what the open access format you're using allows you to do with your work. So the two models I'm going to mention of open access here are so-called gold open access and green open access, but there are many other flavors, other types of open access you might have come across or might come across in future. Um, broadly, uh, gold open access generally requires a publication fee to be paid after a paper has been accepted. Um, but once the paper's been published, it'll be free at the point of use for anybody with an internet connection to read it. Um, and while copyright, as I've mentioned earlier, will generally be retained by the authors, the gold open access license may permit both yourself or indeed other readers of the work to share it widely or reuse elements of that work with suitable credit. Um, there's generally not usually an embargo period either with gold open access publication, generally immediate publication is uh, what happens with gold open access publications. Another model uh, that you might come across that's quite common is green open access. 
um, which allows for a reader to deposit a version of the accepted paper, but perhaps not the typeset version, so the peer-reviewed and accepted, but not the, the final version that you is eventually published online, in a repository where it can be accessed by, for free by anybody. Um, green Open Access doesn't necessitate a payment. It's kind of a, a form of free open access. But it's worth bearing in mind, again, the license you've signed will determine whether you can reuse the work and how you can reuse the work, or indeed how others can do so, how widely it can be shared and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Green Open Access route will sometimes have an embargo period after publication um, that might range from a month, 12 months or more before you are able to deposit your work in a repository. So again, being aware of what that embargo period is, if indeed there is one, is very important to, if you wish to use Green Open Access route. Um, so I've talked a little bit about uh, what can happen after publication um, and during or before publication, I suppose, in terms of journal policies. Um, but what can you do before you submit your paper to a journal in terms of use of preprints? Um, they're increasingly a common part of the research ecosystem, uh, not just the fields that traditionally use them, such as mathematics or physics with archive and so on, but increasingly in the life sciences too, with services such as MedArchive, BioArchive and the like. Um, there are advantages using preprint servers, including the couple of examples identified here. Again, it has with all these things, important to understand what the policies are of your preferred journal um, is towards uh, preprints before you submit to that journal. While many publishers, including the Royal Society, um, welcome submissions of preprints from preprints to their own publications and will not consider the deposition of manuscripts in preprint servers as prior publication. Uh, and indeed, in some cases, we'll have actively, um, active integrations with those preprint servers um, to allow you to submit directly from the preprint to the journal. That's not always the case. Um, not every publisher will permit the consideration of work to be previously deposited in a preprint server. And to repeat my mantra of this talk, if you're not sure, check with a journal or publisher before you use the preprint, before you submit your preprints to the journal. Um, this little stack uh, of logos here gives you some examples of common preprints that are available. Um, some are subject agnostic. They don't have any particular subject definition. Others are more subject specific. Um, and it may be more appropriate to use a more subject appropriate uh, preprint server than a generalist one for your work. Uh, but here are some examples, and there are many others you might have heard of and might be able to use. Thanks, Andrew, and hi, everybody. So we appreciate that sharing your data can feel odd to begin with. This does, however, follow the trend of making science more open to all, for example, through open peer review, open access, and so on. Many journals already request that data be made publicly available. So it's important to develop good habits as soon as you can. And there are many benefits to doing this. Your scientific contributions are preserved. Others can build upon your work and find new uses for your data. Readers can replicate and verify your findings, and it allows appropriate credit to authors if DOIs are assigned to data sets. So you've collected your data, but what needs to be available to reviewers, editors, and readers? Primary data, data sets, code, details of software required, analysis code such as R scripts, and other digital material should be accessible. Please also remember that research data can be observational, experimental, simulated, derived, or metadata. You may not need to submit the raw data collected during an investigation if the standard in the field is to share data that have been processed. For example, CSV files recording response to stimuli rather than the electrical signals on which they were based. If process data are supplied rather than raw data, this should be clearly stated in the manuscript. Exceptions to the sharing of data, code and materials may be granted at the discretion of the editor, especially for sensitive information such as human subject data or the location of endangered species. But authors must disclose upon submission of a manuscript any restrictions on the availability of data, code, and research materials. When it comes to preparing your data, have you included everything 
that might be useful to other researchers? Is it in a clear format? Have you taken into account any sensitive data? If you were reviewing your manuscript, what would you expect to be available so the data can be accessed and assessed? If you were to review your data in a decade, would you be able to understand and reproduce what was done by following your own methodology and descriptions? While you ponder on all of that, I will now pass you on to my colleague, Leanne, who will now talk about data repositories. Leanne. Thanks, Raya. Um, hi, everyone. So there are many repositories available for you to deposit your data, dependent on the type of data and the subject field. Um, so a repository is an online storage space which allows research data to be reserved across time. And it means that any interested researcher, reader, user can find it. Um, it's important to bear in mind the main principles of data sharing. Um, so the FAIR principles, for example, um, are a really useful foundation for this. So are your data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable? Research data repositories ensure that authors can deposit their data in a way which abides by these principles dependent on the subject and discipline. So for example, biological sciences which describe sequence data or genomics should ensure that all relevant nucleic sequences are uploaded to the NCBI sequence read archive or to GenBank. Um, Modelling and simulation studies which use code, um, custom or source code should be available in a software focused repository and these include repositories like GitHub and Zenodo. Earth and environmental science data, there are geo-referencing repositories available, such as Pangea. And where a data-specific repository isn't available, repositories such as Dryad or Figshare are generalist repositories which can be used instead. So on this slide, um, there's some more examples of public archives there are many, many repositories available for authors nowadays. Um, many of these are free, or the fees are covered by the journal which you're submitting to. So one of the many benefits of submitting to a Royal Society journal is that we cover the entire cost of you depositing your data to Dryad, regardless of size of uh, your files. And any supplementary files that you provide with your submission are deposited in Figshare, a pub and publication. As part of the Royal Society's open data policy, we ask that data and code are hosted in a public recognized repository, ideally with an open license of CC0 or CC BY, clearly visible on the landing page of your data set. Use of Google Drive, Dropbox, and other cloud services are not generally acceptable because of their lack of permanence. Just remember that data and code should be deposited in a form which will allow maximum reuse. So on this slide, we have um, a typical example of a data availability statement within a manuscript. So unless there are sort of exceptional reasons for doing so, we will not generally accept statements such as data and code are available upon request from the authors as a minimum uh, we ask that sufficient information and data are required to allow others to replicate the, st the study findings reported in your paper. So if an interested reader wanted to reproduce your results, they have everything they need to do that here in this statement. <clears throat> Editors and reviewers uh, are asked to report on this within their referee reports. Um, so these should ideally be available at the initial submission, uh, submission stage, either as supplementary material or hosted in an external repository with the link included in the manuscript. If you're unable to do this, um, always contact the editorial office to discuss alternative options. And it is also best practice, um, such as in this slide, to cite and reference data sets and code and the repository which they're hosted in. So this means that any data sets used or described in your paper should be appropriately cited with the full reference added to the bibliographic references list at the end of your paper. And if you get into the habit of citing data set and code to ensure this will ensure robust and dissemination and credit to authors. 
So we've uh, we realized we've said quite a lot um, in this webinar. So we've created some tips that might be able to help you. As you have seen, the responsibility of processing your data does not just mean collection and processing your data. It includes how your data will be stored, shared and preserved. So if you create a data management plan before you even start collecting, this may be worthwhile. And this will allow you and your co-authors to keep track of how your data are managed. So for example, think about the type of software you'll be using to run your analysis, whether you need to anonymize any of your data if you're using, if your data are human subject based and what labels and explanations may be needed for clarity. Um, always check with your funder and institution what they may require from you when it comes to data management. They may already have examples and processes in place to help you understand how your data should be managed all the way from collection to archiving to sharing. Um, also on that note, many institutions nowadays now host data in their own institutional repositories. So um, many universities now use Figshare um, so it is always worth checking to see if an institutional repository is already available for you to use to deposit your own data sets. Um, take a note of what other data accessibility statements say in the papers that you are reading and citing. And the bottom line is, as we have said before, always just check with the journal that you are submitting to, see what they say about data and what needs to be deposited and when. So just to tell you a bit more about us, um, our publishing model is driven by the mission of the Royal Society, which is to recognise, promote and support excellence in science. As previously mentioned, we publish 10 journals covering all areas of science and the history of science. Our journals are divided into what we call the A-side journals, which focus on the physical sciences mathematics and engineering. So if your interests are in these areas, we do recommend that you take a look at Proceedings A and also Royal Society Open Science, which publishes across all of science. Proceedings B is our flagship journal in biology and life sciences and Biology Letters publishes short and innovative pieces in this area. Open Biology is our open access journal specialising in cellular and molecular biology. Interface bridges the gap between the life sciences and physical sciences. We also publish theme issues from prominent guest editors. So there are many good reasons to publish with the Royal Society. These are just some of them listed here and that includes fast peer review handed, handled by expert scientists, open access and open data options, and many of our journals allow direct submission from preprint servers. We also provide support to promote your research afterwards and have a fantastic press office who work to do this. They work closely with the authors to help get your research out there to an international audience. Our journals publish a wide range of articles, and these include registered reports, replication studies, reviews, opinion pieces, evidence synthesis articles, along with many other innovative outlets. So we do recognise that publishing isn't just a traditional form anymore, and this means that we accommodate many different types of research and results, and we hope that our journals can offer you a suitable home for your work. We'd love for you to stay in touch with us. Um, you can do that a number of ways via Twitter and our Facebook ac accounts. Um, you can also go on our journals homepage at royalsociety.org slash journals, where you'll be able to see our procedures and policies and the type of content that we're publishing as one of our journals may be suitable for the type of work you and your colleagues may be undertaking. Um, you can email us using our address publishing at royalsociety.org. Um, on behalf of our moderators and our panellists, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, please do stay in touch. We do hope to work with you in some capacity in future. Until then, um, thanks for your time today. Take care and goodbye.